Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, today we have our special guest, Gail Hunt, and she is with Central Oregon Wild Horse Coalition. She is going to tell us about the Murderer's Creek Wild Horses in Eastern Oregon, and she will be talking about the Bureau of Land Management and Forest Services joint management plan for that herd. Public comments on this herd are due on July 14th. Uh, quickly, before I let Gail get started here, I just wanted to show you guys what we're fighting for. These are some photographs that Gail sent me of some of the horses that can be found in the Murderer's Creek HMA. This is an HMA that I did intend on getting to um, when I was in Eastern Oregon year before last, and I just never made it. Um, honestly, it was hunting season, and I just didn't want to go out there during that time. Um, and then I have uh, a little video that I got from Connie from Germany, and I'm going to play that in a second. The video is of a horse named Durango, who is from the Murderer's Creek HMA. She bailed him from the Bass Chop auction pen in December of 2019. And what it's she has found me. about... Yes. What she has found about Durango is that he is a bit of a loner. And that he's never bonded with any of the other horses that he's been around, often spending his time looking out into the distance. Um, and she thinks that he's looking and listening for his band. Um, he is going to be moved to a sanctuary in Oregon. She thinks he might be a little bit happier there because uh, the temperatures will be cooler than where he's at right now. So I'm just going to play the video really quick. It does have some sound and it's only about 30 seconds long. So as you can see, he is a pretty boy. Um, just some quick background information on the Murderer's Creek area. This uh, wild horse territory was established in 1972. It is located in Eastern Oregon, Southwest of the town of John Day in the Malheur National Forest. Um, the size of the HMA is about 73,600 acres of forest land and just uh, under 35,000 acres of Bureau of Management, Bureau of Land Management land. Um, these are considered timber horses. Um, they're known to exist really well with the mule deer, elk, antelope, bighorn sheep in the area. Um, and I did put a couple of links down there at the bottom for you guys. I will throw those in the chat box uh, while Gail's talking so that you can take a look at those. Here is a Google map. Uh, the red circle is approximately where the HMA is located. So you can see it's uh, southwest of John Day. It's a um, pretty couple hours east of Bend and Redmond area, and it's north, northeast of Burns, Oregon. And then here you can see uh, I've got Burns circled down there at the bottom. Bend is over to the left, um, and you can see the other HMAs that are in the area, which include Liggett Table, very small HMA, I, I think 10 to 15 horses, um, Stinking Water, Palomino Buttes, Cold Springs, etc. The public comments on this EA are due by July 14th. I will put the link where you can make your comment in the chat box, as well as the project information provided by the Forest Service. Uh, just remember when making your comments, um, be professional, fact-based, no threatening verbiage, and always include links to your sources. Okay, so here's Gail, a beautiful picture with her and her dog. Uh, Gail is with Central Oregon Wild Horse Coalition which exists to ensure the welfare of wild horses within the Big Summit herd management area in the Achoco Mountains. I did go out with Gail a couple years ago uh, to see the um, horses there in the Big Summit herd. We didn't see any that day, but we did find a water hole that the horses themselves had dug to create a spring for the horses and the other wildlife in the area. Um, her group also accomplishes such tasks as the annual count of the herd and assisting with adoption placements of any horses that are captured from the area. Her email address is there on the screen. I'll put that in the chat box for you guys. 
And the website is cowildhorse.org. And Gail, I'm gonna go ahead and let you get started. Okay, first of all, thank you. Um, I think this is really great that, that first of all, people have an interest in the Murderers Creek um, Joint Management Area. Um, and this is the only way we're ever going to conquer all of, all of the, the power and authority that the agencies have to do whatever they please. And that is if we are informed and if we're talking with each other and we're cooperating with each other. And so um, thank you very much, Heather. Um, you came out to, to see the horses at Big Summit. Now you're doing this and, and that's great. I need to do a disclaimer that email address uh, the Yahoo address, um, that's not valid anymore. You can just give folks my email, that's fine. You can give my phone number, you can give my address, I don't care, we have a job to do. Um, yes. So um, I thought I was gonna be able to hold it together, but you showed that picture. Now my pictures are really bad, and so they don't invoke any kind of emotional response from anyone, but, um, but that picture of the one that was caught and uh, he was in trouble and hopefully he'll get a great sanctuary and, and he'll have a great life. But um, most of the time placements are completely unnecessary because horses should be managed differently than they are. That goes without saying, we probably all agree. Um, the other thing is I'm notorious for um, when I'm supposed to talk, not looking at my notes. And yet this is a webinar all about the notes that I made. So. Um, that's going to be a personal conflict for me is rattling off on on some issue and and forgetting what I was going to say. So we'll start on the positive highlights I found in the EA. I found three. But um, oddly, that's more than a person usually finds in, in an environmental assessment because um, I have to say this as a retiree from the Forest Service, they don't like their horses much. And um, you usually um, can detect some vitriol and at very least some neutrality about their, their management. But I really felt at the end of this environmental assessment and from other interactions I've had with the Malheur National Forest, I think they like their horses and I do think they want the best for them. And that encourages me that if we are willing to work with each other and work with this forest, uh, we might have a really great outcome. So having said that, um, the first thing that really intrigued me is um, most agency documents will try to hide the fact that horses are supposed to be managed principally because they've managed to misconstrue that and say that only managed principally if they're in a designated wild horse and burrow range, which is not at all what the act says. And here we are, this environmental assessment actually saying this, that the horses are supposed to be managed principally, but not necessarily exclusively. Now their intent, which is the unknown, is what were they really saying here? It might've been um, to remind us that horses have to be managed under multiple use. Well, yeah, they do. But if you take the time to really read um, either the Forest Service or BLM multiple use statutes, which are basically identical, they talk about not necessarily manage, managing for every conceivable use within a given landscape, but um, managing for the particular uses that are perhaps unique to that area or managing for the ones that make sense to that area and not necessarily the uses that generate income. That's what it says. And it's just so wearying to always have the multiple use concept cited to us because that means we're supposed to allow everything and everything imaginable in the wild horse areas. That's not at all true. So that is, that is in the good column that they pointed out that, that um, the lands devoted to wild horses and burros are supposed to be managed principally for them. Um, and secondly, you'd be surprised how cumulative in cap impact, excuse me, can have completely differing definitions depending on who's quoting it. Um, cumulative impacts mean direct end impacts, past, present, and future, 
that could play into the decision that's being made and therefore um, would affect the resource that is being discussed in, in a given environmental assessment. Um, we see time and time again where agencies want to restrict cumulative impacts to things that they're going to do in the future, like a timber sale, vegetation treatment, uh, culvert replacement, or something that is on their formal list of projects in the future. Um, that's not what cumulative impacts mean. And I'm sure most of my listeners here um, are very familiar with the history on Western public lands that began about 150 years ago, where um, there were millions, we don't know how many millions of wild horses and burrows, and yet it was inviting enough, lush enough, and, and functional enough that, that this environment invited millions of cattle and sheep to come and devour those resources. And we haven't recovered. We're not going to recover without a lot of intensive restoration. So how can you say that impacts are limited to a future logging sale? They're not. We're struggling with the impacts that have already occurred and that have actually influenced our changing climate. And so agencies really need to discuss past impacts um, things that are currently going on and things that are expected to go on in the future. And much of that has to do with human influence and human presence in the wild horse and burrow areas. So that's why I'm really grateful to the Malheur National Forest that they did frame it in that regard. They talked about things that have affected this, this piece of land and will continue to, not just a, about um, future projects. Um, and also, um, one of the favorite expressions of agencies, uh, particularly the one that we're most accustomed to dealing with, um, is that's outside the scope. Well, we're, we're designing um, the future of a wild horse herd that is protected under a, a federal statute. So nothing's outside the scope if it affects the management of that resource. And, and so what we typically hear when we suggest, well, would you, would you possibly consider reducing um, the livestock impacts um, on the wild horses or burrows? Um, because we can probably find a, a more happy medium here. Um, we just get told that's outside the scope. And yet the Malheur National Forest has uh, repeatedly talked about how adjusting livestock numbers can be a part of this long range strategy. So, um, we really appreciate that. And I made the caveat there on that slide that um, for whatever reason, BLM is, is determined that they can't make any changes to their livestock practices or numbers, except for when the permits renewed every 10 years. And that's why I included um, their, actually, their actual regulations that talk about, yeah, you can, if there's a, a environmental issue or if it affects wild horses and burrows, you can make um, instantaneous changes. So that's the good stuff. Um, there are some of the issues that, that really jumped out as being red line issues. Um, things that if you say nothing else, you need to react to, to some of these um, things that are documented as being in their environmental assessment that um, no one who is familiar at all with, with wild horses and burrows would accept. First thing is um, a preferred alternative that takes a, a um, herd that is presently supposed to be over 500 down to 50. Um, we all know, because I'm very confident that everyone on this webinar today is uh, cognizant of the genetic issues associated with wild horses and the, the um, term effective population size. And, Nobody really argues with that. It's, um, it's been studied by, um, by equine geneticists and conservation biologists all over the world that if you have a population that is less than 50 breeding adults, um, you can basically kiss that herd goodbye because um, you're just not getting enough um, genetic variability over the years and eventually 
um, deleterious effects will occur. So um, why would you take a herd down 250 when that doesn't even calculate out to um, achieving 150 in four years? Um, I just did some, some quick math and I'm no mathematician. I, I went to the Pleasant Hill school system and um, math hadn't been invented yet. And so I'm really bad at it, but I'm still able to, to discern that if you'll multiply 50 by 20% over four years, you don't get 150, you get about 100. And nobody's even saying that there is a 20% increase um, in population with this herd. They're saying it's 11. So I'm not even sure why they wanted to take it down to 50, but it's something that we simply cannot allow. That's not, that's not 50 breeding adults. That's 50 horses. And, and we're not sure why they are not, um, not using the term 50 um, breeding animals in that number because that's not the way BLM does it and BLM is involved in this. Um, you've also got, someone pointed out to me this morning, 50 horses um, struggling to stay, to stay genetically viable. And if you look at the, the fencing structure within that territory, there's fences all over the place and there aren't going to be 50 horses in a glob. There's going to be a few here and a few there. And so you're going to have an effective breeding population of about six or seven. It's unacceptable. So um, the other thing that's going to affect this number is we also are all aware that that um, if GONCON is mentioned in the EA, which it is, that's what they're going to use. We know very well that agencies are fully aware themselves that GONCON is a sterilant. And PZP can also be a sterilant if applied repeatedly to the same mare. We know that. So we need to make sure that GONACON is not on the table. And especially it makes no sense if you're going to not use um, fertility control to take the herd down to the desired number, but to use it after you've got 50 horses. So you not only have um, a herd that doesn't have 50 breeding adults, actively breeding adults, but now you're going to apply fertility control to the ones that are breeding adults. I mean, there's, there's so much that is unacceptable about this statement. Um, and, then, and then this is something we've been watching with um, the Ochico herd in the, um, the Forest Service's own implementing um, manual and handbook, it says, that they're going to apply freeze brands to any captured horses that are up for adoption. Um, not if there's a problem horse here or there, they, they don't necessarily have to do that. But if you're, if you're capturing in mass, then, then they are saying themselves, we need those horses to be freeze branded. Well, they're not going to be. Um, we have never been able to get to admit or get the um, local forest service to admit that that's what they intend. They don't want to have to bother with that. And when you see they cha them changing their own implementing regulations to not just freeze branding, like it says in, um, I think I, yes, it's um, under the manual 2265.51, it says specifically freeze branding. You have to have um, a visible identification. Um, and I'm glad somebody saw my, uh, my typo there, microchip. Um, I had microchip and thank you, Heather, for correcting that. Um, it conjures up visions of if you stand too close to a veterinarian on the um, observation of a gather, they might jab you with a, a microchip that's gonna sail around your bloodstream and they'll know everything about you now. Could happen, but right now we're talking about a microchip and that is just not acceptable. You all know how many uh, federally protected horses are ending up in the slaughter pens already. And this is just inviting that to, to be a straight pipeline. Um, it's not acceptable. Um, we're already having problems with um, the local folks giving titles and there's also no database to back up a microchip. So you basically have a brown horse, a brown grade horse that um, 
as soon as it's abandoned, even once, there goes your history. That's not acceptable. And we also know that uh, BLM is leaning toward this also, but what we don't know is why. I mean, they had an entire uh, promotional thing go on a few years ago it said ride the brand and I, and I liked it you could get all kinds of groovy stuff that said that on it and I, it is something to be proud of as well as um, just to give you a little assurance that the horse is protected if it leaves your custody at some point so anyway that's that's the the good and the bad in extreme and so now now we get to even more boring stuff um, all of the things that an informed advocate is going to have to think about when they submit comments. Um, you, just, you just can't accept the logic and the science that you read in this, these EAs, you know that too. So then you have to start digging, okay, what are the specifics that I just can't agree with? And one of the ones that is paramount to us because um, we ran into the same thing. We, the Ochico and the um, Murders Creek areas both have a lot of trees. You can't count them easily. So what we ultimately ended up doing when they finally turned it over to us in about 2002 when, when we incorporated was um, we asked some search and rescue people, um, what would you do? I mean, you know how to find dead bodies and scared kids and lost dogs, but how do you find horses that are walking around in a tree canopy? And so we do kind of a combination of a grid and assigned area and a blitz. In other words, we search about 60,000, which is a lot smaller than Murders Creek. And what we did was we would assign areas to each unit and they would, they would search that unit for three days straight, making notes as they went, noting um, sign of horses, not just live horses. And it took us a while to, to really get our stride. But once we did, um, I'm very confident that even in timber with horses that are always on the move, we could provide accurate census numbers to the Forest Service. But as nearly as I can tell, looking at all the history available to us, they have never had an accurate count. So if you don't know how many horses you have at a given time, you don't know how there is the correlation establishable between horse numbers and resource damage or resource health. So um, when, you, when you look at, um, at past populations, and that's how you're making your determinations. Well, the resources were in great shape when we only had 100 horses. No, um, you probably didn't just have 100 horses. You may have had 400 horses. Um, and so that, that really is going to color all of the decisions made after that point. And now they're saying um, that they have over 500. Well, maybe they do and maybe they don't because if you're doing it from the air and you've got tree canopy coverage, um, what we don't have in this EA, and I mean, we can FOIA it, but we shouldn't have to. Um, you need to look at that the grid that was created in that survey, because if it took place over a period of a couple of days, for example, you don't know that you're not counting the same horses, because this has nothing to do with, with uh, the pilot and the, and the two people that are counting the same horses in real time. This has to do with what horse stepped in or out of that grid in the time it took the helicopter or the airplane to come back to that same area. So um, I don't really think that any of their past censuses were accurate, not even the on the ground one that they did in, I think, 2006, because it took them a period of months and I don't care how familiar you are with the ground and the horses. Um, we're talking about black and brown horses here. Um, they don't stay in the same bands for the duration of a summer, much less their whole life. So, you know, horses die, horses are born, horses move. Um, I don't consider a ground census that took place over several months to be accurate. So that kind of ruins everything. Um, and if you look at the, um, 
AML determination. It's, it's a good document. And um, I think that the enterprise team did the best they could with the information they had. But when you get to the, um, the, the constraints that are established, such as the, um, the number of 193, which determined the high number of 190 in alternative three. Um, that was some kind of a, a threshold at which some of the resources showed damage. So that's how you got your 190 on alternative three. But again, they could have had 393. They don't know and we don't know. And at some point, uh, I think we'll be talking about the um, biological opinion that the Marine Fisheries Service um, established. And that said, well, as long as you don't have more than 140 horses, you can't even have 141, there won't be any threat to the um, Middle Columbia River population of steelhead. Well, when they issued that opinion, again, they could have had 340 horses. And that's going to be more difficult to fight because I don't know. I know the agency feels they are constrained by that, but we've got to challenge it. And I think um, I'm doing exactly what I promised you I would do, and that's ramble without sticking to my notes. So, um, if there's any way to just reach out and say, "Hunt, get back to the program," do it. Um, and the other problem with not having an accurate count, especially when you do have timber. Um, when you start gathering and you start doing that in earnest, even though it's bait trapping mostly, um, you're relying on a number that you think will be remaining after you gather a certain number. And that's so dangerous. Um, I'm, I'm terrified that that's gonna happen on the Ochico and I think it could happen here because they're, they're um, censusing their horses partially by um, by visual survey, but also by modeling the numbers for the ones that you didn't see. And so there's gonna be some assumptions made that you have um, 50 horses left on the forest after you've gathered a certain number. And you may not, because you may not have ever had that 500 and something number to start with. We've got to point that out or it's going to be um, a really ugly ending. And so, Heather, I think we're finally moving on to um, a new slide about alternative three and why it would maybe be a little more desirable than the other two alternatives. But I'm not saying absolutely, because again, we don't know what the carrying capacity on this landscape is. Um, I'm glad that they offered alternative three, but um, Again, maybe that forest can support an additional 100 horses. And so I think that the first thing we've got to do is we've got to insist that this number be fluid and also that, that we perhaps help them establish a, a better method of censusing so that we all know what we're dealing with. Um, I, also, I also don't like that, and we see this done frequently too, that they're apparently not too serious about alternative three being a viable alter alternative because there's absolutely no fertility control or anything else um, allowed under this alternative. And so that's, that's no longer a reasonable alternative because if we, if we have to um, control the population in some manner, not with going to con, not with IUD or anything ridiculous like that, but perhaps, um, fertility control agents that are known to be absolutely reversible. I mean, I could agree to that. Maybe you could too. Um, that has to be in the mix. We can't allow them to keep holding hostage on, on this alternative three because it's probably the best shot we've got of negotiating a, a long-term solution with Malheu National Forest and Prineville BLM. So, um, in our scoping letter that you guys are all welcome to read, and if you want it, contact me at my real uh, phone number or real um, email address, and I'll ship it to you. We, we talked about um, 
a veterans program possibly being deployed to do this kind of thing, either um, administering um, fertility control, doing range improvements, or greatest of all, censusing. If anybody can get that job done, it's a crew of veterans. And so um, I'm stating that again because we have proposed to the BLM officially and formally in 2018 that we establish um, Veterans Wild Horse Service Corps, um, not just to go out and dart horses, but to do everything else that needs done that the agencies are not able to do. That's um, looking at collecting and monitoring real data, not supposed data. Um, they can do that too. And we have, through our other partners who are developing this program, taken this up to, um, to officials of agencies that really want this done, they want it to happen. And so if we all, again, work together on a program that could help all parties concerned, then, you know, I don't, I don't think the Malheur National Forest needs to continue to bear the burden of misinformation, um, missing data, and census numbers that aren't accurate and everybody wins. So that's why that's, that mention is in there. And also, um, I like the number, the, the AML included in Alternative 3, because I know that could potentially provide um, a resistant population to all the bad things that are already happening to wild horses and all the bad things that are going to continue to happen to wild horses. So that could very easily um, maintain an effective population size of breeding adults, not um, a few horses here and there that might still be able to breed, um, but a real effective population size. I mean, I, I think that that is reasonable and I think it's very doable. Um, the agencies also not, not really recognize that in order to manage for genetic health and genetic identity, they need to, to look at not doing that every 10 years, for goodness sakes. Um, if you were to uh, bring in a horse from outside the area, um, you'd need two or three generations to even see the results of that, if it had any results. So uh, they need to be start, they need to be looking at genetic health right now, and it can be done. Um, we, we started working with uh, Florida International University's uh, forensic genetic program in about 2006. And that was with the Forest Service um, at the highest levels. They wanted a, a program too that could inform agencies about the population and about um, inbreeding status and all kinds of things that DNA can tell you. And so the purpose of, of that collaboration was to see if maybe you could accomplish that through fecal sampling. And um, Dr. Mills at Florida International University did develop a really great protocol for doing that. And um, other research facilities have, have done that as well. So, you know, I couldn't commit to doing a census, but I probably could commit to go out and collect and poop. I'm pretty good at it. And, you know, there's a lot of us that are probably willing to help them out with that. And that can tell you right now, are you in trouble? Um, is there a specific identity you want to maintain? Um, it allows you to make wise decisions at the trap site. So we really need to encourage them to be more proactive with their genetic testing. So um, I think that I have um, bored you enough with that slide now too. So um, just a little bit about um, the AML determination. Again, I don't, I don't know the folks who were involved in that enterprise team. It's a good concept, I think, because you can't really expect every uh, Forest Service and BLM unit to have all the professionals that you need to assess the land condition and to make quality determinations. So an enterprise team that can be mobile and that is informed is probably a really good idea. But um, it looks like they didn't arrive here finding any, any quality data that, that really spoke to uh, trends that you could interpret as 
okay, again, this number of horses is causing this number of, of resource effects. Um, that wasn't available in the file. So it, it kind of, uh, as near as I can tell, and if you're the enterprise team listening to me, correct me because I wanna know what really happened. Um, it looked to me like all they could really do is establish how much forage was available to all of the species that had to be considered. And so that's how they came up with the number of 52, well, they didn't come up with it, they maintained the existing number of 50 to 140, but they also said that the number in alternative three would have enough forage for everyone. And all they could really say about um, ensuing problems was that, yeah, that, that increased the chance of um, conflicts possibly with wildlife or livestock. But again, that's not exactly scientific and I think we should run with that. Um, the enterprise team said you could probably have 190 horses. So let's have 190 horses. And also, um, I think when you really dig into that EA and starting with the AML determination, because it's pretty detailed, um, you see certain um, localized damage that is possibly authentically attributable, attributable to wild horses. But you also see that the, the broader trends that are being conducted for other reasons by, by other resource folks within the agency, they're showing that trends are stable. So well, let's focus on that too. Uh, we have some localized damage that could be tied to large horse numbers, but maybe not. We need to find out what the true correlation is somehow. So um, I think it's really telling that we had um, a good enterprise team go in and, and try to discern what correlations can be made. And it doesn't really implicate the wild horses as much as some might think. Um, and then something that's really near and dear to my heart is slide six, where we talk about um, what would be the realistic impact of just having 50 horses? Because as you might know, on the Ochico, they want to take a, a herd that seems like it might be self-stabilizing at about 130. Um, if you take that down in an environment that is roughly similar to the Murders Creek horses, um, you're, you're not gonna have a horse herd in a few years. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, I'm not an alarmist, I'm a realist. And I've been following these horses since uh, about 1980. Um, and I've had some of my own. And before all of this um, litigation started, I was out there constantly. And I know what I'm looking at and I know the horses. They're not gonna survive if, if the number is held to that, either Murders Creek or Ochico because things happen. Um, I was here during uh, the winter of 92, 93. And in the 2019 document that if you can get a copy of it, try to. If you can't, I'll see if I can get it for you. It's a Murders Creek Wild Horse Territory Herd Management Area Management Plan. I don't know whatever happened to that, why we're doing it again, I got no idea but it's a document, it existed. And it also talked about the winter of 93. So the Ochicos are part of the Blue Mountain range that um, extends clear over to the Umatilla National Forest. So we're talking about a similar environment, similar elevations, similar precipitation levels. Uh, that was my first winter coming back to Big Summit Ranger District. And what I experienced was a winter that came about Thanksgiving and didn't stop until May. Horses and, and mule deer and elk and everybody else was trapped where they stood and it was ugly. And this agency that I thought um, was humane um, threatened that if anybody fed a starving wild horse, they would lose their job. And we don't know because we don't have accurate historical population numbers either, 
we don't know how many horses we started with in 92. We don't know how many we ended with in 93. But Dr. Mills found that there was a bottleneck genetic event that occurred and we pinpointed it to a high probability of being that winter. Um, we know that many, many horses died. They died where they stood. They ate each other's manes and tails and it, it was horrible. And the agency has a policy of not intervening, even if it might be our fault that the horses are in that straight. So we lost a bunch of horses. So we lost a bunch of elk, we lost a bunch of mule deer. Um, and the Ochico National Forest seems not to think that that could ever happen again, even though we experienced it. And again, the Malheur National Forest is uh, more realistic and apparently more humane because they talked about it in this 2019 document. They talked about having a gather planned for 93 that they stopped because the horses were under too much physical stress. And just in the ones that they stumbled upon, they noted that in that year, there were 12 horses that were um, victims of winter kill. That's just the ones that they accidentally found. So that does happen. And um, whether, whether you want to, to say definitively that climate change is our fault or it's just something that's happening, um, we do have a change in climate. And we, we know that it's gonna result in um, hotter temperatures, drier climes, but look at what happened to Northern California. They had um, 56 feet of snow. So we're going to have temperature and, and uh, weather event extremes. We don't know what they're gonna be. We cannot predict it. All we can predict is that we don't know, but it's gonna happen and it already is. So why would you put the Big Summit herd or the Murders Creek herd in that kind of risk category? Um, and also, um, we all know that predator impacts are increasing. Um, when we wrote the, not we, me, but um, I do know some of the people who wrote the 1975 Big Summit plan, they even talked about predation back then. Well, since 1975, the um, predator poisoning um, practices were curtailed. And so there was um, um, an immediate effect that, that the cougar populations exploded. And I'm not here to comment on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but we have lots of cougar now. And they also noted that there was one wolf observed in the Big Summit area in, in 1975. Well, now we have, um, reintroduced wolf populations coming in this direction. We know that um, and ODF and W don't want to say that we have resident wolves here, but if you want, I can provide you with the photograph of uh, wolf scat that I found a couple years ago that is 99% horse hair. And I had it tested to make sure that it was wolf and it is gray wolf. And I can show you the photographs of adult wild horses that barely survived cougar attacks. And I can tell you that our herd is not expanding. Um, if you factor in those predator impacts on a herd of 50 and the potential for catastrophic stochastic other events such as are gonna happen with climate change, that population is not gonna survive. And we, we have to get agencies to admit that. It's, it's happening now, it's going to happen at 50. We cannot allow any herd that has a hundred and some thousand acres available to them, we can't allow this. So um, I'm, I'm asking you to, to apply your own opinions, your own experiences and make sure that that these critical points are, are not overlooked. And this commentary that I'm providing you right now is just the result of my really quick reading and notating um, from a once over of the environmental assessment. There's a lot of other information out there such as the 2019 report, um, 
there's the lawsuit that happened with one of the ranchers. Um, there's other Murders Creek information out there. Um, they also cited in this EA the um, 2017 uh, Blue Mountain Climate Change Vulnerability Report. I would suggest everybody read that too, because there's not one mention of wild horses in terms of what can we do to, um, to corral, if you will, the effects, the mostly drying effects on vegetation of, um, of climate change that we know is gonna happen. And they, they didn't implicate wild horses one bit, but they certainly did implicate um, livestock and to some extent wildlife, even though they're the resource that we want to protect. So um, it's really interesting to, to read the objective and really extensive report that was done on, um, on trying to live with the if in impacts of um, climate change that we know are going to happen. But I would also um, challenge you to challenge the agencies to not just look at how we react to climate change effects, but um, let's get ahead of it. Wild horses are actual climate or um, carbon sinks. They're non-ruminants. They have a little bit of output, if you will, but um, nothing compared to all ruminant grazers. And depending on what statistic you wanna look at, the impacts worldwide of ruminant livestock are anywhere from equivalent to all the impacts of transportation globally, or as much as 87% of all impacts globally. And we, we, cannot, we cannot overlook the effect that this is gonna have on our planet. And if any of you have offspring and your offspring have offspring, um, it's just completely irresponsible of us to miss an opportunity to try and move agencies into more horses, less livestock. Um, that's not gonna be the focus necessarily of our comments, but um, it's something that we need to hold agencies accountable for. Um, you know, I've, I've actually seen appropriations language that, that um, suggests that we get rid of horses because they're so bad for climate and increase livestock because it's so good for climate. So just keep that in mind. And again, I don't, I don't wanna drag on and on about specific points. I just, I just hope that you will comment and this slide kind of tells you what's going to happen. It's a, it's a ridiculous process that, um, that you have to experience to believe. It's not objective. It's, um, it's just an exercise. But still, if you want to have standing to litigate in the future, or if you want to just be able to have um, conversations, you have to be one of those people who didn't drop out of the process. So it's painful, but it's necessary, I feel. And I think it's good that I'm about to be quiet now because I want to answer questions and I want you to think about the things that I have said and contemplate what it is you wanna say that doesn't sound exactly like what everyone else is saying, including us. I'm gonna read this EA again. I'm gonna read all the other documentations. I'm probably gonna go out to the herd management area once before I submit our comments. I've been out there, but um, they don't have anybody fighting for them like a lot of herd management areas do because it's not on the way to anything. It's not a destination point if you're looking to see wild horses because you're going to go out there and not see any horses. It's not an environment that is inviting like Big Summit. It's a kind of a, an uninviting environment because the terrain is steep. Um, the roads are they tend to be bad, muddy, covered with snow or closed in summertime. When hunting season starts, they have a, a road closure system, excuse me, system that eliminates most of the words, uh, most of the roads from travel. So it's difficult for um, an advocate group to, to be highly supportive of these horses on the ground because it's really hard to get to the ground. But we're going to probably take one more trip um, and see if we can see something else that stands out. And if any of y'all want to go with me, call me.
And there are a couple, there... couple. Yeah, sorry, Gail. Okay. There's a couple questions that have come up in the chat box. Um, Alicia's asking, so if it's not a place of great interest, why do they want to remove the horses? Um, here's a here's a little clue. We try to work with our um, congressional members. Um, and we just recently found out again through another very, very active advocate that I cannot praise enough. She, um, she found out that Senator Wyden is trying to, to help establish a livestock grazer um, group. That is, I mean, they can, they're free to establish all the groups they want without his help, but, but one is formally recognized. Um, like I would say probably similar to the Steens Mountain Group, um, which means that agencies um, get to partake, partake in the decision making, making, excuse me, I've talked myself into a corner now too. Um, it's, a, it's a formal group over in Steens that, um, that has bylaws and charters, at least they're supposed to, and government officials partaking in the process and um, they make recommendations exactly like the Wild Horse and Brewery Advisory Board, Advisory Board makes. And um, it's going to eliminate and decrease the advocate's voice and it's going to increase the livestock operator voice. So to answer your question, why does anybody care? Why, are they wanna, why do they wanna reduce numbers? It's a simple mathematical formula. Um, more forage for livestock, less for wild horses. And I might I send you an email and ask you for some more information about that and see if I can put some sort of action item together. I'm pretty disappointed in Senator Wyden if that's the case. Um, somebody else asked, um, it was way up here in the comments, something about why can't there be a lawsuit over AML? You mean AML in particular, not not yep. specific to one herd management area? Um, yes. I'm not saying that we can't. Um, I will say, as um, an organization that is currently in litigation, um, everything's stacked against us. And the first thing that's going to have to happen is um, is we all get together and act as a unit rather than acting separate from the other. If we can ever start doing that, I think we can win some suits and I think we can strategize how we could accomplish that. In the current situation, um, we have too many groups that are headed in too many different directions that um, seem to have excellent memories of, of somebody that looked at them crooked 10 years ago, but really, really poor concepts of how urgent this issue is and how important it is that we work together. You know, if we can all commit to moving in that direction and also um, incorporating some of the, um, the conservation groups that don't hate wild horses. And those are few. Um, after I'm done submitting um, our comments to Murders Creek, um, then I'm supposed to be writing a letter to Sierra Club because they published a really stupid article, incredibly stupid, and they're one of the conservation organizations that is supposed to have softened their position on wild horses. It was horrible. So um, we've got a lot of work to do at a lot of different levels. And right now, all we have is lawsuits, but that doesn't mean that we're winning lawsuits. I, I hope I that read, question. yeah, I read that article and I, there's somebody else um, I know who has been in contact with the Sierra Club trying to get them to um, make their stance supporting wild horses. But that particular article, which was written by a Heather Hansmith, not me, um, yeah. a different Heather. <laughs> I, I did send her an email after that on behalf of myself and Vickery Ekhoff asking her if she would be willing to have a phone call with us so that we could go over the um, things that she put in her article and show her some uh, factual scientific based information. And of course, I never heard back from her. So that's not surprising. But yes, it was an absolutely terrible, terrible article. And I've got one other question here. And then I'm going to let you go, Gail, since we're almost at an hour. 
Um, and just to let everybody know, I am going to put this complete slideshow presentation up on the website tonight um, at saveourwildhorses.net. It will be under the uh, actions you can take now tab, and then you'll see Murderer's Creek. Um, I'll send that out in the email recap as well. Um, and I will include Gail's email address and the link to her website um, too. Um, Connie is asking if you know whether they plan to clear cut more areas um, in the Murderer's Creek area for livestock grazing. I do not know. I do not know. I'm sorry. I did see also that, that Craig um, had a, a comment about uh, self-regulation. And I'm glad he did because as I told you I would do, I failed to look at my own notes and speak from them. And one of the things I wanted to mention was the CA says that horses do not self-regulate the population. Well, um, they probably do. I observed that um, in one of the herds where I ended up eventually adopting the old crotchety mare and, and um, another stallion. That mare was, um, was a witch in her own special way. And she decided that no other mares in her band were going to foal, probably not breed. Um, she accomplished that single hoofedly so if that can be done and that's what she was doing and we do know from craig's research that uh, limited research has shown that that wild horses do in fact self-regulate if you allow them to freaking be wild horses but with all the fences all the capture all the human nonsense going on constantly all the fertility control all the everything you don't have a naturally functioning wild herd anywhere probably. But if we can give that to them, I think we will see that they do in fact self-regulate and not because forage runs out. They, they self-regulate um, consciously. And thank you, Craig, for bringing that up. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Gail. I really, really, really appreciate your time today. Um, I knew that since you were in the area, you'd be able to give us some insight um, that I knew I personally wasn't going to be able to give to the group. So I will um, put in the chat box where they can make their comment and I will let them know that they can reach out to either you or myself if they have a quick question. And we certainly appreciate your time for all of you. Um, Gail does such valuable work there in Oregon um, and she really is key in trying to keep the Achoco wild horses not only there where they're presently located, but also in a healthy herd level. Um, so she does have a GoFundMe um, that's available. If anybody's able to give her a few dollars, that'd be great. And I'll throw that link in the chat box as well. And um, for those of you that wanna stick around for a few minutes, I'm just gonna go over some of the other things that we're doing as Save Our Wild Horses right now. And again, Gail, thank you so much for your time today. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Heather, and everyone else who took the time to be here. Let's let's have a really concerted, informed effect on this proposed action. Thank you all. Absolutely. Thank you, Gail. All right, you guys, I am going to move on to what we are doing right now as Save Our Wild Horses. Um, I can tell you, I haven't talked to her in a few days, but I know that Linda flew to Reno. Um, she spoke at the uh, Wild Horse Advisory Board meeting. Um, and she also went to the very first helicopter roundup of the season, um, which started on July 1st. She went there as a wild horse education volunteer. She was the only person from the public there. No other organization attended the roundup, um, regardless of what their posts might indicate. Wild horse education was the only uh, group there and Linda was the only member of the public there. Um, I'm gonna pronounce it incorrectly probably, but the, this was the Reveal HMA in Nevada. They captured 133 wild horses. One foal died as a result of the roundup. They've already returned 26 stallions to the HMA. And in about 30 to 40 days, they will return some mares who have been double dosed with Gonicon. Um, personally, I have been very busy the last several days um, printing out these 17 page packets to send to 266 members of the 435 House of Representatives. Um, these will be mailed before I get on the plane tomorrow, I promise. And I definitely want to thank Joanne and Gretchen again for all of their tremendous help and dedication in helping me with this project. In about three weeks, you're going to see an email and a post from me asking you to print out a copy of the packet yourselves, which is currently available on the website. 
although the copy that I will ask you to print out will have a place for you to sign your name to it and for you to address uh, specifically to your representative. I'm going to ask you to print that out and mail it to your U.S. representative's local state office. So I am mailing all of the packets to their D.C. addresses in Washington, D.C. I want you to mail it to your U.S. representative's address in your local state. Um, sometimes they have more than one address. Choose the main one. Uh, Congress is not going to be in session in Washington, D.C. for the month of August, so that's why I'll have you send it in about three weeks so that they receive it uh, while they're at home, working from home in August. Um, and then after you send it, give it about a week, call that U.S. representative's office and ask for a quick meeting where you can talk to the representative or to their aide about the current roundup season and the information that's in the packet. Um, and then tomorrow I am headed out um, to Wyoming, Colorado, and possibly Utah. I definitely want to go back and document Saltless Creek and Divide Basin. And I will share what I find with you guys while I am out there. Um, Saltwells Creek and Divide Basin being the two really large herd management areas in south, uh, southern central Wyoming that the Bureau of Land Management plans to zero out. And there are two, now two lawsuits um, on that plan. So Diane, yes, I will have all of that information in the email. Um, I wanted to show you some pictures of what the packets look like. So this is sort of pre-assembled. Um, they were kind of spread all across of our living room. And uh, this is after assembly for the most part. There's still about 50 more packets that I'm finishing up today to add to the stack. And I got some beautiful Hawaiian $1 and $2 stamps to put on those. Um, I ran a quick fundraiser for the congressional packets. And I just want to say a huge giant thank you to everybody who donated. Um, you guys went above and beyond what I asked for. Um, the cost to mail the packets with the stamps, the envelopes, the paper and the labels was about $653. And I think I went through about six bottles of ink. Um, these were full color packets. We had photographs of horses, photographs of cow manure, photographs of horse manure, et cetera. So it took a lot of ink um, to go through those. If you ordered a photo as part of the fundraiser, I will be mailing those out tomorrow before I get on the plane. Um, I wanted to quickly share uh, Chasing Horses Wild Horse Advocates did a really great post today. And uh, they have some quick click and send actions that you guys can take. I'm going to see if I can throw these in the chat box. If not, I'll put them in the email. Um, they have a, a quick action item asking the Theodore Roosevelt National Park to stop using Gonacon. Um, they're also having a rally in July. So if anybody is anywhere near Medora, North Dakota and Theodore Roosevelt National Park and you can attend their rally, there's a place for you to buy tickets. And then she also included in that blog the link that she did for us on the McCulloch Peaks um, click and send. And this was a very shortened version of the 17-page um, letter that I'm sending in. This is sort of a prerequisite to the packet. So uh, the goal was to do this quick click and send. Um, your U.S. representatives, your two senators, and the White House uh, all get the click and send so that they can take a look at it. And then it's followed up by them receiving the packet from me. And then again, hopefully from you guys um, uh, when you send it in, in about three weeks when I send out that post. Uh, Chris, let me know today that so far the click and send, which has been available for about four or five days, has only had about 442 signatures on it. Um, so if you guys could do me a huge favor and uh, do that quick click and send item. I'm gonna go ahead and throw it in the chat box for you and I'll put it in the email. And if you could do that today, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, I just made a really quick list of the upcoming roundups. Um, July 7th, which is Friday of this week, BLM is gonna hit the Nevada Wild Horse Range where they plan to round up 350 wild horses and permanently remove 138. The discrepancy between those two numbers is that they will be returning um, usually an even number of stallions uh, versus mares who have been treated back to the range. July 9th, uh, they'll be starting both the north and south units of the antelope complex. This is in Nevada. And total between those uh, two sections, they'll be taking about 3,100 wild horses and they do not plan to return any of them to the range. July 15th through September 30th, they're going to start a bait and trap on the Little Sands Basin HMA in Idaho. 
Um, this is one of my personal favorite areas. It's really pretty. The horses are gorgeous. Um, those of you who joined the Zoom I did a few weeks ago on the Idaho Wild Horse Plan would remember me talking about Sands Basin. They plan to take 49 horses via bait and trap, um, removing 28 of them permanently. August 14th, they're going back after Palomino Butte HMA in Eastern Oregon. Uh, this is an area that I did visit a couple years ago, just after they did the roundup in 2021, I believe it was. Um, I think altogether, Jane and I saw maybe 15 horses at most in that entire area. Um, the Palomino Butte HMA is just east of Burns and south of the Murderous Creek HMA that we spoke about today. They're going to permanently remove 200 horses from there. And then other areas on the schedule so far this year include McCulloch Peaks, Stinking Water, Hog Creek, Black Mountain. This is not the Black Mountain Burrows in Arizona, but the Black Mountain Wild Horses in Idaho. Uh, Little Book Cliffs. They did take the uh, Shayless Idaho herd off. And in place of that, they added Hard Trigger. Um, and from what I gathered, the reason they took Shayless off the list was because there is a local, um, I don't know if they're a sanctuary, I, I believe they're a sanctuary, an or organization there who worked with BLM uh, to keep the horses there for now. I, I'd like to look into that a little further, maybe talk about it at a future Zoom meeting. Um, it kind of relates to what we've been talking about with the Adopt an HMA, where if you live in an area near an, a wild horse or burrow herd, that maybe you can work with BLM to try and keep the horses there, help clean up the range of the trash and so forth. Um, other HMAs that they're removing this summer would include High Rock, Fox Hog, Wall Canyon, Desatoya. Those are all in Nevada. They are going after Sandwash Basin again, doing a bait and trap. And then they're ending the season presently uh, with the Calico Complex, which is also in Nevada. Um, Beth, the reason behind all of these roundups and the reason on the um, gather schedule, nearly every single one is attributed to AML. So they just want to get the horse herds down to what they consider the appropriate management level. I have been doing some graphics and sharing them out. Um, I'm trying to do them on the herds that are being managed, at least the ones that I've been to so that I have photographs of the horses to share with you guys. These are great for sharing out and they're all going to have pretty much the same um, storyline, which is that the herds are being rounded up. They were recently rounded up. They're being rounded up again. Um, how many they're taking, what they're taking the herd down to, and how the herd will basically not be genetically viable. The Little Book Cliffs HMA, which is in Colorado, uh, east of Grand Junction, was probably one of the prettiest ones I've been to. It's one of only four herd areas um, out of the remaining 165 that does not have livestock grazing within the herd area. And you can tell by those pictures on that graphic on the right just how healthy the area looks, how tall the sagebrush is. And that is all because there's no livestock there. So you can see what the difference is. Um, I'll run through you guys' questions in the chat box here in a second and see if anybody else has anything they wanna talk about. Um, because I am gonna be gone for about three weeks, we'll hold the next Zoom meeting probably sometime in early August. Uh, what can you do in the meantime? Watch for my post and email asking you to print and mail the 17 page packet on McCulloch Peaks to Congress. It's going to be hopefully uh, one of many letters. It's a follow up to the packet that we handed out on Lobby Day in April at the DC conference. Uh, Linda and I are planning on working together on another packet um, that she wants to go uh, do boots on the ground in DC at the end of August and give to congressional members. We'll provide that one as a printed version that you can send to your representative as well. Um, it, it, and you guys, we need your help with this. Um, you know, we're just a couple people. Um, it's a lot of work for one person to print out and mail a 17 page packet. It's expensive. Um, again, I couldn't have even done that packet without the help of Joanne and Gretchen. Um, so when, when we do these action items where we've put a lot of time and effort into them, we really need you guys to pull through and help us by printing them out and sending them to your representative as well, or putting it in PDF form and emailing it to their office or faxing it to them, something. We need your guys' help. We cannot do this by ourselves. Um, once you mail that packet in, give their office a quick call, ask for an appointment. Um, really the main message we're going after right now is that we want to stop funding the Bureau of Land Management. Always say Bureau of Land Management, not BLM, so they know who you're talking to. 
Yes, Craig, go ahead and send it anyway. Um, Stop funding the Bureau of Land Management and place a moratorium on all wild horse and burrow roundups until Congress can investigate and hold a hearing into the BLM's misuse of taxpayer dollars and failed attempt to run the wild horse and burrow program. That's our main message right now. And you're gonna back it up with the information in the congressional packet that we have available from April and in this packet and any future packets that we put out for you guys. See if I have one more slide here. Nope, that's it, okay. Um, so if anybody has any other questions, if you want to raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask it really quick, you're more than welcome to. Let me look back through the chat box really quick and see if there's any other questions. Hey, Heather. Craig, yeah. Julie. Yeah, go ahead. I got a quick question. Yeah. So since I live close to DC, I was going to reprint your um your trifold and i'm going to actually i had already talked to the park service i'm going to stand outside department of interior and i'm going to highlight the um, helicopter roundups and hand out other information is there specific things that you would like me to hand out because i'm going to go and get all this um printed out like your brochure about the handout or the um roundups and also about um, I wasn't sure if you wanted me to hand, I can hand out other things that you have posted on your site to make the public aware, but that's what I'm going to start doing. I think, yeah, absolutely. And thank you for doing that so much. Um, I think the other thing that might be really helpful, and I believe it's on the website, you can email me if you can't find it on there, is the seven asks. And this was actually the cover page to the congressional packet. So if you can't find it separately, if you just look at the congressional packet, I believe seven asks is page one or page one and page two of that. Um, I think that would be another really helpful thing to hand out. Thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. And anybody else have has any ideas? Um, I guess <laughs> I was gonna say I could put here, let me just type my uh, email in there, and that's all I have for that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, you know, if you want to pop me an email, too, and you should have my email address from the graphic um, from today or for e from emailing me for the uh, link to the Zoom, um, throw that question at me again, and I'll see if I can put a little more thought into it for you as well. Diane, you have a question? Uh, yes, hi. Uh, for those of us that don't feel comfortable um, talking with our representative or trying to um, get the facts across. What, what can we do about that? Um, at the last law, um, last rally, watch DC thing, I had one set up uh, with our rep and I actually talked to her assistant, um, uh, that's uh, Senator Warren's assistant and but i was very tongue-tied and i don't feel i was could represent the group as well as having somebody more experienced with me or or you know well i guess with me how do you how does that work well you know it, if if you're able to schedule a phone call or a zoom meeting with your uh with the staff or the aide because you're likely to speak to them rather than the directly to the senator or the representative right. yes. really our goal right now is, is representatives not senators so much um, because the representatives are the ones who give the blm the funding to do these roundups right so if you're able to schedule that phone call or zoom meeting um you know one of us can sit in on the call with you we're happy to do that. Myself, Linda, I, I'm sure I could wrangle up a couple of other people to do so. Um, you know, as you know, these staffers and aides are, to me, they're children, right? They're in their, their young mid-20s, right? Yes. So, yeah. um, and they love, most of them actually love having a phone conversation with people. Um, you know, so, as, so doing, you do more phone conversations than Zoom meeting, kind, Zoom meeting kind of thing. Well, they they might prefer a Zoom or they might just do a phone call with you. Either way, you can just okay. ask for a phone call. That's fine. And that way you don't have to be on camera and you can just talk <clears> to them <throat> for a quick 15 or 20 okay. minutes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Angela, you have a question? Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know um, if you know the two organizations that are filing the lawsuits. 
So the first one was a big joint lawsuit um, with Western Watersheds. Um, Carol Walker's listed on it. Uh, Kimberly Carroll's listed on it. AWHC. I feel like I'm missing a name or two um, that's on there, but that that was a joint lawsuit between people and organizations. The new one that okay. I just saw, and I haven't read it yet, is I believe it's Friends of Animals, and somebody could correct me if I'm wrong on that. Yeah, um, I heard I, I believe... heard about that one too. Yeah. Friends yeah. So those are the those are the two that are run. I you know I, I don't know a lot about filing lawsuits. I wish they had kind of all done it together, and I don't know if if both filing lawsuits at the same time is beneficial. Brenna says, yes, it is Friends of Animals. Um, if it's beneficial to have two uh, lawsuits filed for the same thing at the same time or not, but I would need to actually read them both to see if they are actually focusing on different aspects of zeroing out the herds or if it's about the same thing, but you know, maybe two lawsuits is better than one. I don't know. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that sounds great. And if anyone needs help talking to their representative and they wanna do like a Zoom meeting, um, they can contact me as well. I put my uh, email on the comments in the chat box. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Angela. That's great. Appreciate yeah, it. Sure. Anybody else? Oh, okay. I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go for today. Um, again, I'll work on getting this slideshow presentation up on the website um, tonight. And I'll include all the links um, so that you can just click on the links and go directly to them underneath of each slide. You guys have my email address. You have Angela's in there. Um, just let us know if you have any questions about anything. And I will let you know when we do the next Zoom in early August. Thank you, everybody.